I was cleaning my office drawer the other day, and I stumbled across an iPhone that I broke last year. I thought about trading it into one of those trade-in services, and although the phone turns on, the most they offered me was $37. I think what I found most ironic about this is tearing the phone apart and putting it in a display box increased the value sixfold. You would think it would be worth more when it actually worked, but hey, some things are just weird like that. I think this project works best if you use a broken iPhone. Some of you might have one laying around, but if you have any other great ideas, feel free to use any device. I'd actually like to see that. Aside from the iPhone, some of the other items on the list are a kit that I got off of Amazon so that I can open the iPhone, a 1x3 4 foot long oak board, and a 10x12 piece of glass. I also had a piece of paper there that I originally intended to be the backdrop, but we're going to change that later in the video. I started off by measuring the oak, and if you recall from earlier, the piece of glass that we're using is a 10x12. This means that each respective cut should be a little longer than the glass side that it corresponds to. I'm sure that's confusing, so here's a visual to show you what I'm talking about. The white inner square represents the glass, and the brown portion represents the shadow box that we're building. So if you notice, the shadow box is a little wider than the glass. I think a safe way to play it would be to make 12 inch cuts for the 10 inch glass side, and 14 inch cuts for the 12 inch glass side. If I were to do this again, I'd probably get a 5 foot board just because I cut it really close with a 4 foot board. At this point, we're starting the mitered cuts. This is entirely possible with a circular saw, but I'm using a miter saw in this case and I turn the blade to 45 degrees. Now before you start cutting, make sure you have a mental visual of the cuts that you're going to make. In theory, each cut should be facing the same direction. Reference or visual from earlier if you need to. At this point, we're testing the fitment of the glass into the pieces of wood for the shadow box. We're going to cut a groove into each wooden side for the glass to slide into. So if you form your box and your glass comfortably sits on top of it, then you're in a pretty good spot. Now we're making sure that we're making a perfect rectangle. In order to do so, pair the 10 inch side with the 10 inch side and the 12 inch side with the 12 inch side, and then use them as reference against each other to make sure that they're the exact same length. And if you notice that one is a little longer than the other, then that's perfectly fine because you'll be able to line them up and cut off the remainder in a second. Now that you've made sure every opposite side is the same length, we can move on to making the grooves for the glass. Again, this part is also doable with a circular saw, but I'm using a table saw just because it's a little easier. We know that the wood is 3 fourths of an inch thick so we're just going to raise the blade to about half of that. I always recommend using the actual piece of wood that you're going to cut as a reference point just to make sure your measurement's correct. Now we're setting up the fence so that the groove is about half an inch away from the front of the frame. We're giving one side a groove for the glass frame and then we're turning that same piece of wood around and giving it another groove for the back panel. Also be sure to use extreme caution when handling any kind of power tool. There are plenty of tools on the market that'll help you keep your hands away from the blade, so be sure to use those instead of doing it the way that I did it. I went back to my glass piece and saw that we were getting very close, but things weren't fitting right just yet. The grooves needed to be cut a little tiny bit deeper. I raised the blade a little bit and gave each piece of wood another pass. I went back to test the fitment one more time and it looks like we're all set. And once that was wrapped up, I finally had a chance to focus on the back panel. Now, keep in mind we made grooves on both sides of the shadow box, which means that we can use the glass as a reference for the back panel, because the fitment should technically be the exact same. Alright, so I know that the back panel was going to be too thick for the groove, and that's okay, because I just planned on using the groove as a reference point. We want to make sure that the back panel is accessible, just in case we ever need to clean anything inside. With that in mind, we're cutting off the excess material on the side that's going to hold the back panel. In woodworking, they call these rabbits. No, not those kind of rabbits. We've set up a pretty solid foundation, so now we're going to get started on the back panel. 
I'm adding wood glue to the back panel to basically use it as adhesive for the piece of paper that we're going to be gluing to it. I ultimately ended up scrapping the piece of paper idea just because it didn't give the box the background that I was looking for. And if you're wondering why I kept some of the footage in here, it's because I think it's a good demonstration of how we should be spreading the glue and it'll be useful later. At this point, I was trying to make sure that the paper on the back panel would sit still and I'm pretty sure this is the most usage these books have gotten in the past few years, and that weight. So like I said, we scrapped the paper idea and I had to sand the board one more time. I'm really glad that I didn't go with a paper backdrop because I felt that I was compromising a little. I had initially wanted to do a suede-like material just to give it a nice feel and look. I stopped by at the local Joanne to look for the suede-like material and they didn't have the bright white that I was looking for, but they did have this nice tan, and I almost think this tan works a little bit better with the color of the wood later on. I know that prices can vary because of sales or even the region, but I had plenty of material left over and it only cost me like $3. While I waited for the fabric to dry, I moved on to the sanding. This lumber had been nicely pre-milled, so I didn't need to sand it much, but I still went through my regular process of 120 grit, 180 grit, and then 240. Once I was done with the sanding, I used Verathane's pre-stain to condition the oak. And if you're wondering what this does, it just helps the wood absorb the wood stain for a nice and even finish. The directions on the conditioner say to let it sit for around 30 minutes, so that's exactly what we're going to do as we test out some of the wood stain for the frame. And while this is loading, if you like what you're seeing, take a moment to like and subscribe. Doing so will support the channel, and I'll get to keep making cool projects like this one. The can on the left is dark walnut, and the one on the right is golden oak. In this particular test, I think the dark walnut looks a little bit better, but if you like the golden oak more, let me know in the comments. I think it'd be interesting to hear a few different opinions, even if they're the wrong opinion. Well, there are no wrong opinions, but I'm really hoping that I made the right choice. After the test was done, I moved on to the staining portion, and if you watched my last video, notice that I took my own advice and I wore rubber gloves this time. Well, I only wore one glove, but it's still an improvement over last time. Wood stain looks great, but not so much on your hands, it can be pretty difficult to remove. This was completely unintentional, but I found it kind of funny that the wood ended up matching the table. I swear, if I had intentionally tried to match the table, I don't think I would have nailed it. We're not really seeing the contrast between the wood and the table, so I changed the background a little bit, just so you can get the full effect. And I had always felt a little weird about oak, because it reminded me of furniture from the early 2000s, but you can see that change in the color really makes a big difference. Now that the front side of our back panel has dried up, we're going to secure the fabric a little bit by folding it over and applying some wood glue. I think using a hot glue gun would work pretty well too, but lately I've been putting a lot of faith in wood glue. The next step is super important, so you want to make sure you're paying attention. If you have a puppy sitting around, be sure to give him or her some attention. You've probably spent plenty of time on the project, so it's the least you can do. I waited until the next day just to give the back panel and the wood frames some time to dry. If you've never seen this method before, it's actually a pretty cool one. You're going to be recreating the frame just like we've done in the past, except this time you're going to be putting a little bit of glue at each corner. And once you're done doing that, support the corner using painter's tape. The painter's tape is there as a placeholder while the glue dries. After that, you won't need any reinforcement. This goes without saying, but you want to put the glass piece inside the frame before this is all glued up. You also want to keep the back panel as far away from the workstation as possible, just so you don't stain it the way I did. If you manage to stain your back panel, even with the fair warning I gave you, don't stress, it's a pretty easy fix. I pretty much just reapplied the glue, laid the fabric over it one more time, and then secured the back like I did earlier. It has only been 20 seconds for you, but at this point it's been a few hours for me, which means that our wood glue is dry. And everything looks square, so I think we're good to go. Next, you want to grab your iPhone, or whatever device you're going to be using for this, and you're basically going to pry it open. In my case, I'm using the iPhone kit that I got off of Amazon. But, in your case, you're going to want to make sure that you have all the tools you need to take your device apart. And I only say that because some specialty products have very specific tools. I didn't have a specific list of the items I wanted to keep or anything like that. I more so just set aside the components that I thought would look cool in the display box. 
didn't keep any of the screws, mostly because I had no clue how I would even present them in the first place. We now have all the phone pieces that we're going to be using, and we can start setting it up just to see what it's going to look like. And while you're arranging these pieces, be sure to heat up your hot glue gun. You're going to need it in one second. Make sure you test this in as many ways as possible. Once you apply the hot glue, you're not going to be able to remove any of the components. You'll notice that I tested the spacing various times just to make sure everything was perfect, and I even compared it to the frame. This was done to set up a reference point. You want to make sure that none of your pieces are too close to the sides of the frame. Otherwise, the spacing is going to look a little disproportional and you're not going to have the result you want. At this point, I've glued everything into its place and now I'm just going to polish some minor details. Keeping in mind that the phone won't be as easy to access anymore, I want to make sure everything is nice and clean. To make sure the back panel is secured, I drilled a couple of screws from the back into the side walls. And these screws were small, so they definitely didn't damage the frame. My only regret about this project is the fact that you're not here to see it. And that's because the reflection sometimes takes away from the subtle elegance, at least when it's being filmed. Regardless of the fact, I really like this project because the design of the iPhone is really what's making the statement. The box is just there to amplify that. And to me, that reinforces the idea that great design is universal. You can probably put this box anywhere, and I'm sure it'll catch someone's attention. If we're thinking about the phone itself, I think this also shows that one person's trash can be another person's treasure. Thank you for watching.